Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hi, and welcome to Self-Improvement Atlas, the personal science insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm Marie Stella, your host from Melbourne, Australia. Let's start the show. Welcome back to Self-Improvement Atlas, the Personal Science Insights Podcast. Now, in a world of copious amounts of media consumption, it's almost too easy to fall into hating your own body and staying in there. So this week, we're speaking to psychologist Dominique Mulhane, who has a keen interest in eating disorders, weight management, and body image issues, to guide us through some strategies on building that self-acceptance. Hi, Dominique. How are you? Hi, Marie. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. That's great to hear. Thank you for coming on. Um, So I'm really curious to know, in your line of work, what seems to be the most common challenge for people on the road to self-acceptance? I think as you sort of mentioned in the intro, the bit about kind of our society and culture today, just really placing a lot of emphasis on appearance and sort of how we should look um, is and and really unrealistic ideals um, that make it really hard for someone to accept themselves as they are if they're not fitting into that mold that society puts yeah, forward. Completely. And it's almost a universal issue. You see people these days who do fit into that beauty standard and still don't accept their body because they feel like they're not quite there yet or they need to be even better. Um, But that's a great preface to our topic for today. But before we get further into detail, we'd love to get to know you better. This is Have You Met Dominique? And my first question for you is, what is your favourite book? Yes, so I tend to like reading things that are not work-related at all, just to give myself a little bit of a break. So um, probably a recent book that I really enjoyed was actually more of a fantasy novel called The Name of the Wind um, by Patrick Rothfuss. Um, just really enjoyed the the world it created and the characters. It was a good escape from yeah my everyday job. Yeah, it sounds really, really nice. And I feel like that's kind of refreshing. I like when I talk to other guests um, who do stuff that are similar to you, I usually get like, well, it's my job. I just tend to like read all these different things that are related to my job, to be honest. And I always found that really admirable, but this is really refreshing. Um, So what are some of the other books that you usually veer towards? I kind of like, um, so yeah, fantasy is one genre that I like. I also like um, sort of like historical dramas um, and things like that. There's uh, a couple of books by an Australian author, um, Avril Kenny, I think yeah. her name is. Um, I really enjoyed her books as well recently and more kind of lighthearted, but just an easy read. Just... Historical dramas are so interesting too. Do you ever like get your interest peaked in a certain era in time just because of like one historical drama that you've read? Yeah, you can go down the rabbit <laughs> hole sometimes. <laughs> Kai, you read one thing and then you try and find something similar or like a TV show or documentary about it. Yeah, and then you try and find out what happened in real life during that time, right? Yeah, completely. It's just so fascinating, so I'm with you there. Um, But with regards to movies, what are some of your favourites? Yeah, favourite movies. Um, My childhood favourite, I grew up doing a lot of dance, so my childhood favourite was a movie called Centre Stage, um, which is sort of about the American ballet academy and and what it's like to 
into that world of like professional ballet. Loved that growing up. Um, I also really like older movies, like old movies from like the 40s and 50s. Um, big fan yeah. of like Audrey Hepburn, Judy Garland. And so a lot of those kind of movies as well are my favorites. Yeah. It's really fascinating to watch all these old movies and see how things used to be done. Um, gives you a window into the world of like an era where you have not lived in. It's almost like a completely different world. So that's really interesting. And it must have been nice to get some dancer representation in, in the media. Um, and as for food, if you had to pick one cuisine to eat for the rest of your life, what would you pick? Mm, difficult choice to make. <laughs> um, ooh, I, oh, I'm i going to go with Thai food. Oh, I love, Thai. What, do, what dishes do you like from Thai food? Um, I really enjoy Thai green curry um, or some of the noodle dishes, like a pad siu is one yeah. of my favorites. Yeah, completely. I sh I regret asking that question because I'm really hungry <laughs> now. I really want to part see you. Um, <laughs> now, do you have a role model either in your professional or personal life? Uh, I'm more of a personal role model is probably my dad, I would say. Um, he's, and... um, yeah, just faced a lot of health challenges in recent years and just continues to work hard and have a positive attitude about everything, which is admirable. Oh, that's so sweet. I was going, I was just about to ask you what traits of his you find the most admirable. Yes, I think definitely just that sort of positive attitude, sort of, yeah, getting on with things even when yeah. they're challenging um, and just staying true to who yeah. you are as well. He's very much who he is and then doesn't let anyone change him and yeah. I think that's really good and kind of ties into the self-acceptance yeah. um, topic today as well of just yeah, yeah being who you are and, and not letting anyone else change you. I definitely find those traits admirable as well I mean like sometimes I see people like that and I just like think how do you do it because when I when I experience a minor inconvenience, I just have a breakdown. Do you have moments like that where you're like, oh, everything, everything's going wrong? And but my dad, he's a great example. Like I should be more like him. Um, how do you view it? Yeah, of course. I'm a human like anyone else. I think we all have those moments. Um, and so so just try and have that awareness. <laughs> Today is one of those days. It's just a difficult yeah. day. Um, and just trying to remind myself that it's temporary. It'll it'll not last forever. Yeah, it's really great that you have um, a dad like him to be there for you and be a role model for you. It sounds really, really sweet, the relationship that you guys have. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, now we'll move on to the interview section. And my first question for you is, how would you define personal development? Sure. So personal development, I would define as sort of increasing your level of personal awareness um, and also finding a sense of purpose in life as well as a sense of enjoyment as well. Um, and the other thing I would say about personal development is that it's a lifelong pursuit. So it's not something that you, you know, you can just read a book or, you know, watch a documentary and, and say that's the answer to everything. I think it's a really ongoing process that we continue yeah. to develop and, and learn more about ourselves yeah for sure it, it's not going to be an overnight thing which I think is probably a misconception that some people have um so you explained it really aptly now how would you define body image so body image is our subjective thoughts and feelings about our body um and so that might not always be exactly how our body is objectively so it's more just our personal view of our body mm -hmm. and what is the distinction between positive and negative body image no, so positive body image would be someone who's having 
you know, kind of more neutral or positive thoughts and feelings about their body. They might have a greater level of acceptance of their body or appreciation of their body, what their body can do. Um, and then the negative is sort of the flip side of that. So someone who's having more critical thoughts about their body, they might just really dislike their body or feel uncomfortable in their body. Um, and then maybe engaging in some behaviors as well um, to try and change their body or um, is sort of really picking out all the flaws in their body. And how does self-acceptance tie into this? Um, is it the only solution for having negative body image or, um, yeah, and what constitutes a self-acceptance? What does it mean to have that? So when I think about self-acceptance, I think of it as accepting things as they are now in this moment rather than waiting for something to change or get better before you can accept it. Um, and I think this really ties into body image because a lot of people are wanting to, say, lose weight or, or change their appearance in some way. And they'll say, no, I'm not going to be happy with my body until I reach that kind of goal. Um, and so that level of acceptance to just go, you know what, this is my body as it is right now and that's okay. Um, it doesn't need to change. Right. And it doesn't mean you need to stop working out or um, eating mindfully or doing any of these things that you're working towards either. It's just accepting that your body is what it is right now and not necessarily, maybe like probably not necessarily eagerly going towards that goal, if that makes sense. I actually have no idea like if that is at all what you're saying but please feel free to jump in and and add your opinions because I'd yeah, love to hear sure. them. No I think that's you know you can still eat mindfully you can still work out it's more we want to shift the way the the focus off your weight or off your image um, because the more you focus on that especially if you've got a negative body image that can become all consuming and that's all you think about. Um, and so we want to be thinking more about how can I take care of my body? How can I show my body some love and respect? Um, and so that might be through your eating. It might be through movement or exercise. It could be hobbies. It could be social relationships, be all sorts of things. Um, but really try to look at it more holistically. Yeah. And what are some of the other fundamentals to instilling positive body image within oneself? I think really reducing comparisons to other people um, and sort of running your own race. Um, I know it's really hard with social media to see someone recommending a particular workout or a diet program or something and and seeing their image and their body and going, oh, well, they do that and they look like that. That's amazing. I want to do that. Um, but we're all individual, unique humans with our own genetics and own body shape so we can't compare directly to someone else um so really trying to reduce those comparisons and just do what works for you what makes you feel really good in your body um and then kind of along those lines as well i often recommend like a bit of a social media cull so unfollowing all those pages uh, or people that kind of trigger those negative body image thoughts um, just so you're reducing the exposure to that and again that means you can focus a bit more on yourself and the things that make you feel good um and in your opinion how does one's perception of their own body contribute to their personal growth journey yeah so i think kind of like i was saying before if you're thinking a lot about your body it takes away from other things um, and so that might affect your ability to engage with hobbies to engage with relationships study work other activities um, sometimes you know people might avoid things because of how they're feeling about their body and so their engagement in everyday life really starts to reduce um, and then in turn, that affects their mental health as well. So we see, you know, higher rates of depression, anxiety, 
um, because people are so preoccupied with their body and, and not engaging in all of the other things that might make them feel really right. good. That's a really good point. And it sounds like a really isolating experience almost. Um, what would you recommend such people to do if they're feeling isolated because of this? I think, I mean, firstly, just remembering you're not alone. This is a really common problem that we have in our society to feel really negatively about our bodies. And sometimes that's helpful in itself, just knowing you're not the only person experiencing this. Um, I think then yeah, trying to re-engage with your life, take that focus off your body. Um, find yeah, hobbies, activities that you enjoy, spend time with your friends, your family, um, and think about what's really important to you. Is your body the most important thing in your life? And or are there other things that are really meaningful to you where you could be spending your time and attention? Yeah. And does nutrition and exercise help at all in this um in supporting this journey towards self-acceptance? What are some practices that you might recommend? Yeah, so we know both nutrition and exercise definitely have a role in mental health. Um and so um, the research states that, you know, engaging in regular exercise and especially movement that you enjoy doing. So the exercise shouldn't be torture. You shouldn't be forcing yourself into the gym or boot camp. If that's not for you. It can be any kind of movement, but just regularly moving your body can help reduce stress levels, improve sleep, help reduce symptoms of anxiety, depression, um, and likewise with nutrition as well. So, we know that, you know, eating a, a diet that's really varied, has lots of different, you know, fruits, vegetables, legumes, um, like fatty fish, nuts, seeds, all of those things um, contributes to brain health um, and can also help reduce anxiety and depression. Um, but we also don't want to deprive ourselves because, again, kind of like the exercise, if you're forcing yourself to do something because someone says it's good, you're not going to be enjoying that process. And then that kind of takes away from the the psychological benefits that you might be getting. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so they definitely play a role in yeah, brain health, overall mental health. Um, but again, we want that to be in combination with lots of other things. We don't want that to be the focus by itself. Yeah. Um, and in a world where working is kind of, the you know it takes a center stage in our lives um but at the same time you know costs of groceries are rising costs of foods rising um can be really difficult to make the time to ensure that you're getting a varied um like a, a variety of foods in your diet so what advice do you have for that yes tricky it's a really common topic with a lot of my clients at the moment just worried about that cost of the grocery bill um and so i would just try and keep it simple like do the best you can i think if we could try and get too perfectionistic about it and say that you have to eat all these things that adds a lot of pressure and stress to the situation so do the best you can with the resources you've got um try not to cut things out if you don't have to it might be alternative swaps it might be you know switch switching fresh for frozen options um, like frozen veggies are really convenient um, could be things that you're just storing in pantries like tinned um, items are really easy and, and usually a bit cheaper as well uh, it's just trying to make it easy and convenient so you can fit it in around a busy work schedule um, and then maybe also looking at you know, some more cost-effective options as well. Yeah, that's really good advice. Um, I think frozen veggies are probably 
overlooked quite a bit because for some reason we have this preconceived notion that um, frozen f- frozen veggies are worse than fresh veggies. Um, but I guess no veggies are like it's better than no veggies at all. Yeah. And the problem with fresh veggies is often, you know, we buy a lot of them and they sit in the fridge and they might go bad because we haven't got the time to, yeah. to cook and prepare a meal. Oh, Whereas yeah. the frozen vegetables, you've got on hand, they're ready to go, you can kind of add into anything that you're making. Which yeah, completely. Is great. I feel that so much with the fresh veggies. I feel like every week I have to throw out some bits left of fresh veggies and I try not to so I have to like freeze the rest of them but by the time I've got to freeze them they've already kind of gone like not well the not pleasant to look at to say the least <laughs> so frozen veggies it yeah um like why stray away from that why be afraid of it you know it, it's it's giving you the nutrition that you need from veggies. Um, it's a great way to incorporate veggies into your diet and you can make fried rice with it. Who doesn't like fried rice? I've actually yeah. never heard of someone who doesn't like fried <laughs> rice. Do you like fried rice? I do. And that's often like an easy, yeah, quick meal. Have some rice in the pantry, some frozen veg, yeah. maybe an egg. Um, yeah. And like some soy sauce or something, whatever you've got in the cupboard. Yeah, and exactly. And if together. you want to add more meat, you can easily add like some chicken, like rotisserie chicken or something like that. Or if you want to add more volume of veggies, you could probably add some broccoli. You don't have to do it all the time, but it's there. It's like, you know, really easy. So um, that's a really good advice. And as for therapeutic approaches, are there any of them that are known to be particularly effective with developing self-acceptance or positive positive body image? Yeah, so I'd say cognitive behavioral therapy has the strongest evidence base. Mm-hmm. Um, and through CBT, we often, you know, we're looking at someone's core beliefs and, and how they feel about themselves and trying to challenge some of those kind of automatic thoughts or assumptions they might have um, and trying to sort of reframe their perception on things and whether that's yeah about themselves or about the world around them um, that can be really helpful um, and often in the work that I'm doing with clients for like eating disorders or body image concerns we're also challenging yeah, a lot of those social sort of cultural norms, things like fat phobia um, and sort of stigmas that we might have um, about people's bodies. Um, so that's a big one. And then also mindfulness practices as well. So really getting people to just sort of slow down, tune into themselves a bit more because um, we're very fast paced uh, society and just our minds are racing constantly so really trying to slow down and just check in with your body see how you're feeling um see what thoughts you're having and and kind of using that to guide you as well yeah for sure and um what resources books or exercises would you recommend to listeners who would like to work on self-acceptance and positive body image. Um, is this essential alongside CBT and mindfulness practices? So I think it really depends on, on where you're at with your body image and I guess the level and self-acceptance and the level of impact that that's having on you. I think if it's something that's really affecting your functioning day to day, then definitely, yeah, speaking to a psychologist or a therapist um, who's trained in the area um, is important, but there's also some really great self-help resources available too. So, for example, um, in Australia, we have um, a centre called the Centre for Clinical Interventions, or CCI, um, and they have a lot of workbooks that you can access for free online on these topics around self-acceptance, body image, um, as well as a range of other mental health issues. 
Um, but I find they're really helpful. They have a CBT approach in the workbooks um, and quite often I'll recommend them to clients that I'm working with as well. Um, and they can go, just go through them in their own time. And so that's really helpful. Um, but also like some podcasts, um, there's so many out there now, but maybe just a couple to mention would be Maintenance Phase um, and Body Kindness are both really great ones for kind of breaking down diet culture, explaining some of the research and helping people build a better relationship with themselves and their bodies. Um, and along similar lines, a couple of books could be um, We Don't Talk About What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Fat. Um, by Aubrey Gordon, uh, and another one's called Your Body is Not an Apology uh, by Sonia Renee Taylor, I think it is. Um, I've heard a lot of people highly recommend those books um, for this kind of work. Yeah, that sounds incredible. Those sound like amazing recommendations and they sound really interesting too, like the workbook um, sounds incredibly incredibly helpful um so thank you for sharing that with us uh lastly what advice do you have for individuals who are struggling with societal pressure to conform to those beauty standards yeah so the first thing i would say is that beauty standards are changing constantly um and so trying to keep up with them is a never-ending battle um if we think back you know like we were talking about old movies before so thinking back to like marilyn monroe right i had this really curvy figure that people admired and loved and then over time it changed and it became thinner um and more kind of that you know supermodel skinny type look um through like the 80s and 90s and then we started getting a bit curvier again with the Kardashians and then it became all about fitspo and building more muscle. And so you can see it really has evolved and changed over time. And so, as I said, it's a never-ending battle that we can't win. Um, so I think firstly just reminding yourself of that just to try and take the pressure off um, is really important. I think also like I was talking about earlier, really looking at your social media um, and other kind of media that you might be consuming and trying to remove anything that makes you feel worse about yourself. Um, so if there's any particular pages that you find triggering or anything that you look at and every time you look at it, you're like, oh, why don't I look that like that? Or why is that so hard for me? Um any of those sort of things, just unfollow, get rid of it, don't need it. it just makes you feel worse about yourself. Yeah. And it's also just really, really subtle the way it affects you too. Um, and most of the time you don't even realize that it's a, it's a bad thing that you're feeling this way. Um, but thank you so much for sharing that advice with us. That's um, so aptly said with how beauty standards change across the eras and the different time periods. Uh, now we're moving on to the practices and habits section. And the first question I'd like to ask you is what is a habit that you practice that helps you with your self-acceptance? Yeah, good question. Um, I would say something that I've been working on is what, like a gratitude practice. Um, so this might apply to my body if I'm having a bad body image day or it can be about myself generally um, and so trying to reframe and find things that I appreciate about my body or about myself trying to focus on more on the positives things that are going really well um, just to try and shift that focus away from the negatives yeah it's kind of like gratitude journaling but for like specifically for your body and there's something i did hear from someone else um recently which was instead of just asking what are you grateful for ask yourself why are you grateful for it and that will kind of provoke your thoughts a little bit more and that will real make you realize how much you appreciate too so maybe that's something that people could try um, and are there any challenges to during this practice? 
I think one of the challenges is that level of belief, right? Like we can say the nice things to ourselves, but whether we believe them or not is a, another thing entirely. Um, and so just trying to really be careful with that language that you're using with yourself, trying to be non judgmental and sort of more compassionate towards yourself. Um, and that it's okay to acknowledge the challenge in itself as well and, and just kind of be like, yeah, this is really hard for me today. I'm struggling to think of anything yeah, I like, like about myself. Yeah, and like you said previously, we live in such a fast-paced society that sometimes you do think, okay, I'm grateful for this thing about my body and then next moment you move on to the next thing and you've completely forgotten what you said previously. So um, do you have any advice for overcoming that yeah it's it's a tricky one i think it comes down to the actual practice and and what you're doing for your body um so it's one thing to be thankful for it and have that gratitude i guess the next layer upon that might be like body respect so how do you show your body respect how do you take care of it um and so that might come back to the nutrition, the the movement, it might be just getting outside, getting some sunlight, some fresh air. Um, it might be having a good laugh. It could be anything that makes your body feel good, uh, but really engaging in those things rather than the behaviors that, again, might be reinforcing or contributing to that negative body image. So the comparisons, maybe Know, some body checking behaviors like looking in the mirror a lot and critiquing yourself or um, even like grabbing at different parts of your body that you don't like and um yeah so really trying to avoid those and focus more on the behaviors that make yeah. you feel better in your body yeah and is it important to set a specific frequency at which this practice is done or is it okay to just do it as you go whenever you feel like you should yeah, no. I tend to do it as I go. So if I notice the negative thoughts pop up, then I'll try and yeah, reframe and, and think of something more positive or yeah, refocus my attention on a behavior that makes me feel better. Um, some people find having a bit more structure to this practice really helpful though. Um, so if you struggle to do something kind for your body, it might be better to actually pencil it in the diary make time to do those things that make you feel good um, whether that's just going for a walk in the morning or yeah cooking yourself a really delicious meal um, but just having a bit more structure just to make sure you actually do it um, yeah and how do you think this practice would impact someone's perception in life kind of i think it really works on so shifting your focus from the negative to the positive. And in saying that, it doesn't always have to be positive. It can just be neutral as well. It's really about just trying to move away from the negative and make sure that we've got a bit more of a balanced view overall. Um, I think the more you do that for yourself, it sort of extends outward into other areas of your life as well. Yeah. Completely. And just like what we mentioned at the start of the episode, um, personal growth is a lifelong journey and so is self-acceptance, I suppose. So it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to be like today my I feel bad about my body and the next day I am completely okay. Like I, I love my body two bits. I, it's going to take a lot of time and repetitive Ness, um, and doing that practice of like body neutrality and um, accepting it for what it is to get there. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that with us. I feel like we got to know a bit about you. We also got to know what practices you think would be useful and um, we got some insight as to what resources we could find online that would be really useful to this journey. Now we're moving on to the open mic and this is your opportunity to talk about anything that you're passionate about and it doesn't have to be related to the topic. So the floor is yours. Take it away. Sure. Um, I guess I want to 
you know, a special interest area of mine is kind of like pregnancy and, and postpartum. Um, having gone through that myself uh, a couple of years ago now, it really piqued my interest in, I guess, kind of similar themes around self-acceptance and, and body image. It's a really big challenge for a lot of um, mothers and people going through pregnancy because of all the changes that happen in our bodies. Um, and there's a big emphasis on kind of like bounce back culture as well, where mothers are expected to just birth a baby and then suddenly be back to pre-baby weight and, and look exactly the same as they always have. Um, and this adds so much stress and pressure to what's already a really difficult time. Um, you know, learning how to be a mom and, and having a new relationship with the, the new baby um, and changing family dynamics. And there's so much already going on um, that we really just don't need that added pressure to mm-hmm. be worried about losing the weight. Yeah. So I think I there could be a yeah. lot more support for mums in particular, but even dads, partners, whoever's in that family, um, to really just you know take the time to to reestablish what your family looks like now, um, and to support each other through that, and and try and take the pressure off things like body image that you know really aren't that important right now like what's important is your overall well-being well-being of your child and and the relationships you have with each other yeah i couldn't agree more i feel like no one talks about the postpartum experience um especially body image and your the changes you're going through with your body um in the media a lot of times in tv shows uh you know pregnant women you they show that they're pregnant and they have like a bit of the extra weight for like an episode or two and they go completely back to normal um and a lot of the time it doesn't even show the struggle that they're going through with losing that extra weight and it doesn't even address like that's not important um so and then because of that i feel like people get influenced and and think that this is something that isn't important to talk about, but it certainly is. And it's definitely something you want to think about before you get pregnant too, Um, you know, um, because it's such a huge thing. And along with the weight change, there's also uh, like a a host of other postpartum um, symptoms or experiences or disorders that um, you have to consider. Um, So what do you think, partners of pregnant uh, like women in postpartum women what do you think partners of postpartum women and um their family and friends can do to support them good question i think listening to the mum or whoever has had the baby is the first thing women have very different expectations and, and sort of needs during that time Um, some love all the help they can get and and want everyone involved and others want a bit more space and and time to ease into this new life so i think definitely listening but then also just doing some of the other stuff like the household chores the cleaning the cooking um you know doing some laundry taking that pressure off the mum to do all those things uh, and allow her to just bond with her new baby. Yeah. And oftentimes family come in and they just want to hold the baby and that's great. But then it's like, okay, well now. What about the mum? Yeah. 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 Someone care about the mum. And what sort of language would be helpful with postpartum women um, going through this weight change? Yeah, it's, Again, I think we need to take the focus off the weight. Um, the, the weight is just a number and it doesn't represent how well you're doing as a mum or just as a person in general. So I think really shifting the narrative back to the more mental health, like how are you actually feeling? Um, 
Are you coping? Are you managing? Do you need extra support? Um, yeah, really checking in on that because I think oftentimes things go missed, like, you know, postpartum depression, anxiety, um, even there's postpartum psychosis as well. And a lot of things just get missed because people aren't tuning in to to that. And I think there's also a level of acceptance that, well, yeah, well, of course you're going to struggle. Like having a baby is hard, um, but sometimes there's not that recognition of there might be yeah. something more yeah. going on here. Mm -hmm. So what do you hope to see in the future with the acknowledgement of the postpartum experience? Yeah, I think media has a big role to play in this. So currently we see celebration of pregnant women who have the quote unquote perfect pregnant belly and, you know, smooth, no stretch marks. It's just like their body with a bump. Um, and same with postpartum, we see the celebration of someone who's back on the red carpet six weeks after having a baby. I think we need to stop that celebration. Yeah. And again, actually, like, let's just check in on how they're doing. Let's not focus on how they look. Um, and yes, yeah, so I think media probably has the biggest role, but even just shifting the narrative socially and culturally um, to put that emphasis back on overall mental health and well-being as well is really important. Yep, that's really well said. Thank you, Dominique, for joining us today. If our listeners want to find out more about you and what you do, where can they go? Yeah, sure. So I currently work um, at a practice called Mind Body Well. That's a private practice focusing on eating disorders and, and body image concerns um, based in Melbourne. But I do telehealth appointments through them so I can see anyone um, wherever. Um, so yeah, you can find me through their website, mindbodywell.com.au. Um, and we also have an Instagram page, mindbodywell, also where we're posting um, different resources and, and tips and tricks about how to navigate some of these challenges with eating and that body image also. All right, that's amazing. We'll link those in the show notes along with the resources that Dominique's mentioned um, at the middle of the podcast. Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in and we'll catch you in the next episode. You've been listening to the Self-Improvement Atlas, the Personal Science Insights Podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. For more episodes like this from 10 different life management perspectives, search LMSL on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts and Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts so you can get updated on everything we have to offer. We have a wide range of topics readily available for you to check out. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it and subscribing to our channel as it helps us grow and bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website at pe.lmsl.net where you can join our movement. I'm Marie Stella. Thanks for tuning in.